loving Father in heaven, please send the Holy Spirit to be with us this morning. Please speak to each one of us today. Please share with us exactly what we need to hear. And please speak through your word and through this dust. Bless us to have the same faith as the people that uh, we're going to study about today. And strengthen us to that end as we study together. In Jesus' name. Children of Israel had gone through the wilderness for a long, long time. How long did they go through the wilderness? Forty years. And how far was the trip from Egypt to Canaan? How long did it normally take if somebody really wanted to get there? How long would it take? It wasn't very long, Dennis, that's right. Two, three weeks, that's the, pretty much the uh, time that I've heard. Two to three weeks. So for 40 years, they wandered around the same mountain. They wandered in the wilderness. And finally, in Deuteronomy chapter 2, if you'd like to open your Bibles there, we'll start there this morning. Deuteronomy chapter 2 Verse 2 and 3. Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto me, unto Moses, saying, Ye have compassed this mountain long enough. Turn you northward. God said, you know, Moses, 40 years is long enough. It's time to go home. Turn to the north. Turn to the north. Now, let's just analyze that verse for a moment because otherwise we could just pass it by and say, well, that doesn't have anything to do with me. Well, how long have we been marching around in the wilderness? How long? How long? Okay, 150 plus, but basically 150. 150 plus years we have been going around this mountain. We've been, as it were, going around a mountain again and again and again. Now if the children of Israel after 40 years had gone around in this area long enough, and they probably, in that 40 years' time, had made some little inroads into the soil that they were traveling on. What do you think we have made? They did it in 40. We've been here almost four times as long. What do you think our soil looks like, folks? At least a rut and possibly a walled corridor so high that we can't even see over it. You realize that? What's that, Rodney? It's deep, Rodney. Four times as deep as it was for the children of Israel. Now, what do you think Christ is saying to us today? If he said to Moses, Moses, you've gone around it long enough, turn north. What do you think Christ is saying to us today? Do you think maybe there's a little bit of frustration on heaven's part today with, with His people? Do you think Jesus, in this incredible patience and long-suffering that He has, do you think He might be starting to feel a little bit antsy? 160 years, folks. Is it time? Is it time to go north? Is it time to go north? I think it is. 
I think it's past time. Past time. Now the people who first came out of Egypt... Of those who came out of Egypt that were 20 years old and up, how many of them died in the wilderness? All of them died but two. Now those are not very good odds, are they? All died but two because somehow there were some lessons that weren't learned. They weren't learned. Now because there's parallels between God's people back then and God's people now, I think we would like to feel that the reason why God took the children of Israel to the promised land was because um, they had finally gotten ready. But Deuteronomy chapter 9 paints a different picture. Notice what Deuteronomy chapter 9 says. Starting with verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 9, starting with verse 4. Speak not thou in thine heart, after that the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee, saying, For my righteousness the Lord hath brought me in to possess this land. But for the wickedness of these nations the Lord doth drive them out from before thee. Not for thy righteousness or for the uprightness of thine heart dost thou go to possess their land. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee, and that he may perform the word which the Lord sware unto thy fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So why was God going to take a people to the promised land? Because they were ready to go to... What did the Bible say? It said the evil and the wickedness in the land was so bad. It was so bad. God said, I've had it. We're going in. I'm going to take a people in. Because it's so bad in the promised land. Now, folk, I, I do believe that there is a little bit of a difference and there is a distinction that I think can be borne out here. And that is this. God is preparing a people, isn't He? He's preparing a people called... What is that select group called? What are they called in the book of Revelation? The 144,000. God is allowing events in our world to prepare a people who will be ready, won't they? And a people who will demonstrate by the grace of God alone. They will demonstrate to the world and to the universe that God does what He says. They will demonstrate. God's character in their life, won't they? They will. And so if you and I learn the lessons that God is trying to teach us, we could be among that select group that will witness to the entire universe of the goodness and the power of God. I do believe That if God didn't turn up the heat and allow certain trials and tribulations to come our way, I think we love this world too much. Is that a fair statement? I believe we love it too much and we don't want heaven enough so God turns up the heat to see what we'll do. But the wickedness of this world is as bad, if not a thousand times worse, 
than it was in the promised land in the days of Moses and Joshua. Turn north. It's time to go home. The children of Israel turn north and they start knocking out kings. They knocked out Og and they knocked out Sihon and they knocked out Balak. And they started systematically knocking down these insurmountable kings. Because the God of heaven was able to do that. But then things started happening. Aaron dies. And Moses dies. And so God chooses a man. And who was the man that God chose to lead the people into the promised land? What was his name? Joshua. That's right. Joshua. And Joshua was given a beautiful promise in the book of Joshua chapter 1 and verse 5. What a beautiful promise. What an encouraging promise to this general of God's people. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 5. The Bible says, There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. What a wonderful promise that you and I can claim today that no matter who comes, no matter how many come, to oppose, to hurt, to destroy us, God has said there isn't anybody that can stand before you all the days of your life. Now that's encouraging. As we hand out literature, there shall not be any man able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And so the children of Israel, they're marching north, and they have come to the eastern side of the promised land. And they've come to the eastern side of the Jordan River that separates them from Canaan. There was that river. And at the time of year when the children of Israel arrived, you would have thought that God had made a mistake. We sometimes think that God has made mistakes, don't we? Because we have planned out a certain way that something is going to happen. And in our minds, as we all do as human beings, we say, okay, at such and such a point, this is going to happen. And when I do this, this is going to be the result. But when we actually get there, we say, Lord, you had to have made a mistake. How could you have allowed that to happen to me? You made it ten times as hard. Does God make mistakes? The Bible says He is the rock. His work is All His ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is He. So when I don't have as much of this, or if I don't get what I'm expecting, or things don't work out the way that I wanted them to, did God make a mistake? No. Never have. Never has. Why is it? Why is it that we think 
And remember now, the word we is inclusive. It means you and it means me. Why do we think that God has somehow made a mistake? Do you know why we are sure God makes mistakes? Our understanding is limited. Yes, Dennis, it is. Not only is our understanding limited, but we feel that God makes mistakes when the answer He gives to us cuts right across our path. We think a mistake has been made when it, it demands of us submission. Because we don't like that, do we? How does submission feel? Good? No. Submission cuts. Submission hurts. Submission causes pain. So God must have made a mistake then. What did Jesus say in Matthew 16? In fact, let's read it together. Matthew chapter 16. Verse 24. Matthew 16 and verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples. And who are Jesus' disciples? You say, well, let's see. There were 12. There was uh, Matthew, and there was John, and James, and there was Bartholomew, and uh, there was Judas. Let me see. Maybe I can get all 12. Who else is included in that word disciple? Us. That's right. We are. So Jesus said to us, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Self-denial and taking up the cross of Christ and saying, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. It's not easy. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't give everybody a happy face and a a good feeling inside. Denial and taking up a cross and following after Jesus means disappointment. It means trial. It means pain. It means the possibility of giving up every single thing in this world that we count dear. That song, Embrace the Cross, where Jesus suffered, though it will cost all you claim as yours. Sacrifice will seem small beside the treasure. Eternity can't measure what Jesus holds in store. Embrace the life that comes from dying. Come trace the steps the Savior walked for you. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. 
And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Peter did not desire to see the cross in the work of Christ. The disciple shrank from fellowship with his Lord in suffering. Selfishness is death. No organ of the body could live should it confine its service to itself. To the disciples, his words pointed to their submission to the most bitter Humiliation. Submission even unto death for the sake of Christ. There was one letter, Jim, I didn't share this morning, did I? Everybody loves to be patted on the shoulder, don't they? We all love to see the cards that say, we've got some Bible study. Because those are thrilling, aren't they? And we can just say, praise God for those. Sometimes people don't say those things. Sometimes people say unkind things. But God didn't make mistakes. He says, follow me. Wherever I go, wherever I lead, Follow me. That person's letter there that I'm choosing not to read was very unkind. Very unkind. But it's okay. If that's part of what happens when you seek to do God's will, then let's get a million of them. Let's get a billion of them. Because God doesn't make mistakes. And if that's a part of a process of chipping away so that there is no self in us, so be it. Let it happen. Let it happen. Children of Israel are planted at the Jordan River. It's springtime. And the waters have over, they've flooded over the banks. There were no fording places where the Israelites could go across. So how in the world are the Israelites going from east side Jordan to Canaan land? How are they going to do it? power of God, John. That's right. And God brought them there in a hopeless position for that very reason. Because He said, do you want to see how you're going to get across? Do you want to see how Jericho and all the Canaan tribes are going to be defeated? Do you want to see how that's going to happen? It's not going to be by your weapons. It's not going to be by Joshua. It's not going to be by any man. That's why I brought you to the Jordan River in springtime. Because it's only going to happen through submission to the power of God. It's the only way. 
The only way. Everybody in the camp, they knew. There was no way across that river. What a joke. Nobody could get across. They weren't going to swim across a flowing river in springtime. Impossible. I know some of you today are facing Jordans. Probably all of us today have a Jordan in front of us. They come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. It looks insurmountable, it looks impossible. And maybe some of us today are fighting it and saying, Lord, you made a mistake. How could you dare bring me to this position? I'm in a miserable spot. And God says, I didn't make a mistake. I brought you to this Jordan for you to learn to submit to me. That's why I brought you to this Jordan. So whatever the Jordan is that we're facing today, whatever is tearing our heart out, causing pain, causing suffering that we can't understand and it's about to drive us nuts, May we, along with the Apostle James, in James chapter 1, may we take heed to these words. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. The Bible says, My brethren, count it all joy, when ye fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So if we've come to a Jordan in our lives this morning? Can we count it all joy? Knowing that the trying of our faith works in us patience. You say, oh, Bill, I don't need patience. I've got enough patience. I need action. I need things done. I need to get this to happen in my life. I'm patient. I just wanted it to happen yesterday. Last week. Two weeks ago. One of the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5 is long-suffering. Another word for long-suffering is patience. Let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Can we wait that long? That's tough, isn't it? Wanting nothing? That's what the Bible says. Wanting nothing. So they stared at the water. How are they going to get across? How are you going to get across? How am I going to get across? Joshua was told, 
Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3. This is the plan. This is the blueprint. Joshua chapter 3, verse 3. They commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which ye must go. The ark of God, and what was in the ark of God? The Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod that budded. Okay, both of those were in that ark. But the Ten Commandments were in the ark. And the priests were to carry that on their shoulders, on the poles, down to the Jordan River. And the people were supposed to watch. And they were supposed to stay at least the six, what, how many cubits was it? 2,000 cubits is a little over half a mile. So there was to be a distance of about a half a mile as the priests are marching down towards the swollen Jordan River. And the people are to watch them. They're supposed to sit and watch as the priests march slowly down to the Jordan River. And then the priests, as we find repeated again and again in this chapter, the repetition of the Ark of God, the Ark of the Covenant, repeatedly mentioned. The priests are to carry the Ark of God. The ark of God is to go in the way of God's people. You know, last Sabbath, after the meetings, there was a lady that came up to me and she said, she said, Pastor, she said, I am confused. I don't know which way to go. I don't know what to do. And I said, ma'am, In making any decision, you ask yourself, is this in obedience or in disobedience to what God has said? She said, I have a cat that I love. I love this cat. And I said, ma'am, tell me something. How much do you love your cat? She said, I would give my life for that cat. I said, does that Kate cat take up a lot of your time? She said, I spend hours a day with that cat. I said, ma'am, from what I'm hearing you say, it sounds like you have too great an affection for your cat. And your cat occupies too much of your time. She said, it does. And I love my cat. I said, ma'am, do you have time to spend with God? She said, not very much. I said, ma'am, the Bible says you shall have no other gods before me. And I said, ma'am, what you're telling me, it sounds like your cat is your God. And I said, ma'am, whatever is in your life, there's the law of God. You put it up against that law. And if what you're doing breaks that law, then that is your God. That's your God. Whether it's a cat, or I said, ma'am, If you go out to the store 
And you hear a voice that says, steal those candy bars. I said, now ma'am, there's the law of God. Your mind says, steal the candy bars. What are you going to do? I said, if you steal the candy bars, you've broken that law, haven't you? Whatever, whatever comes into your mind that is contrary to the law of God, you need to forsake that. You need to lay that down. You need to deny your drive for that thing. You need to deny it. And say, no, I want to follow Christ. Because if we don't, what has that thing become? It's an idol, John. That's exactly right. It's an idol. And if we're following an idol, are we going to follow God's ark into the Jordan? Uh uh. You see, folks. The ark goes to the Jordan. Where do the idols go? The idols go back to Egypt. That's where they go. They go back to slavery, back to ruin. The ark of God goes right into the swollen stream called Jordan. That's where it goes. So you match up whatever is in your life Where does it play in light of the Ten Commandments? The ark of God went down to the Jordan and God's people are going to follow the ark of God wherever it leads. And sometimes, Most of the time, it's where we didn't want to go. And so as the priests are carrying the ark and they've gotten, they're they're within 440 yards of the uh, Jordan River, and they're 440 yards from the children of Israel, and at that point, the water split, didn't they? Is somebody awake out there? Okay, let me say that again. The children of Israel are a half mile from the Jordan. The priests have walked halfway. The water is still another quarter of a mile away. And the children of Israel are a quarter mile behind the priests. And it was at that point in the story that the waters divided, didn't they? No. Uh Uh-uh. The waters didn't part then, folks. And when the priest got within a hundred yards of the water, the waters divided then, didn't they? No, they did not. That's right, Ms. Rains and Claire. They didn't part, folk. The water was still rushing down. And as the priests are getting closer and closer and closer to the Jordan, do you think there might have been a few anxious moments? Do you think maybe a few people back there, the Israelites are going, what's going on here? And do you think maybe a priest who is carrying the ark on one shoulder was maybe eliminating his fingernails on the opposite hand? Saying, Lord, I'm heading to the Jordan, but it hasn't moved. See, folks, sometimes you and I, we see trouble coming, we see a problem, and we say, Lord, take care of it right now before it gets near me. Because I know if I hit this thing, it's going to hurt. And God doesn't do it. And then what do we do? We start crying and saying, Lord, you don't love me anymore. You made another mistake in my life. God didn't make a mistake. 
He's trying to teach us humility. He's trying to teach us submission. Those priests kept walking folks steadily right down to the Jordan until their feet, their feet were in the waters. The waters covered their feet probably up to their ankles, somewhere here. And they stood there in the Jordan River. Now how long their feet stood in the Jordan, we don't know. But it wasn't very long. And after their feet were in the water, God performed a miracle. He didn't do it too early. And He didn't do it too late. He did it right on time. Right on time. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11, the Bible says this. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. The very first part of the verse, Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 11. Ecclesiastes is right after Proverbs, just before the Song of Solomon, the Song of Songs. Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 11, it says, He, he hath made everything beautiful in His time. The reason why you and I do not see more of God's power in our lives is because we never allow God to get to that place. Because we run ahead and do it our way. And in most of our experiences, spiritually speaking, we've probably drowned in the Jordan. God makes everything beautiful in His time. Not my time, not your time, not the pastor's time, not our parents' time, his time. Everything beautiful, his time. The waters parted. Now maybe some scientist or some uh, modern scholar would like to sit down and say, well, the reason the waters parted was because we had a phenomena called uh, underwater seismology that made the waters part. And that's a bunch of baloney. The waters parted because God Miracle working God. The waters parted because God is still interested and still loves his children. Joshua chapter 3, verse 16. Verse 15 and 16 it says, And as they that bear the ark, were come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water. For Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon an heap very far from the city Adam, that is, beside Zaratan. And those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, that's the dead sea, failed and were cut off. And the people passed over right against Jericho. And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan. And all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. 
You see, once the priest stepped into the water, and the waters parted by a miracle of the God of heaven, the priest then proceeded and stood right in the middle of the river. Right in the middle of the river. And all the people then, when they saw them, and they saw the water parted, all the Israelites came the half a mile and went right across the Jordan. Now, was that the end of the story? No, it wasn't, man. That's right. The rest of the story was Joshua told 12 men. He said, each of you from each tribe, you go in and you take a stone out of the middle of this Jordan River. And you bring those stones and we're going to set up a memorial right here on this shore. So that when in times to come, your children will say, what is that for? Why is that here? That you will say the great God of heaven parted the Jordan River and allowed us to go over on dry ground. Now what is the point of that? How many of us have set up little memorials? How many of you can remember great things that God has done for you? How many times has God split the Jordan when you thought, I don't know how this is going to happen. I don't know how we're going to live in 10 years when so-and-so retires. I don't know how so-and-so is going to live. I don't know how, how, how. Did you set up? Stones of memorial? Did you? So that the next time you come to another Jordan, you can say with faith and courage, Lord, I know you're going to part the waters this time because you did it back there. Or, when we come to the Jordan now, are we saying, Oh no, Lord, don't, don't. It's not going to happen. We have nothing to fear for the future except as we forget the way the Lord has led us in our past. One of our songs in our songbook, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing calls for songs of loudest praise. Here I raise my Ebenezer. Hither by thy help I've come. And I know by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. What was Ebenezer? Samuel, after a victory over the Philistines, set up an altar of stones and he called it Ebenezer. And he said, folk, this memorial right here, never forget what God has done for you in your past. Never forget it. Let's set up some memorials. We all have them. God has been very gracious to all of us. Let's set up some memorials of how God has delivered us so that as we face Jericho, as we face more formidable enemies, we can remember what God has done for us in the past. Let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, thank you for Jordan Rivers.
thank you for things that are so painful, that hurt so bad. Thank you for these things because they teach us patience. Don't take us out of trials. Deliver us from ourselves in our trials. Help us to count them all joy, knowing this, that the trying of our faith works patience. And please, please, help to develop in each of us a patience that wants Bless us to that end. In Jesus' name, Amen.